I design each knife kind of like on the metal. Like I don't prototype in paper or anything. I just kind of jump straight into the the physical prototype. I, I have no automation. Um, my mill is barely a mill. It's more <laughs> of a glorified drill press. <laughs> Belt grinders, bandsaw, buffing wheel, sandpaper, that kind of stuff. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 40 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to another good one. We've got an uh, interview coming up with uh, Ian Pekarski, CMF Metalworks. But, Bob, before we get into that, I want to remind our listeners that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial just by going to audibletrial.com slash the knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. Bob, another uh, good interview coming up. But before we get into your chat with uh, Ian, uh, I know one of the questions you always talk about is, um, you know, social media. How is it affecting, mm -hmm. you know, the knife world and that kind of thing? And yeah. uh, Instagram especially is kind of uh, a tie-in to our guest today who's got just some gorgeous pictures on, on Instagram. Yeah, and, you, you know, that's uh, really, you know, kind of propelling his knife business, if you will. But the Knife Junkie's got an Instagram account, too, theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram. But... Maybe not in a lot of posts lately. <laughs> super, <laughs> super lazy with it. And, and if you're lazy with Instagram, that's, that's about the, that's, that's the end mm -hmm. <laughs> that shows you that you're lazy. But actually, uh, there's, there's been an uptick. I'm trying to, uh, well, in, in the interest of reducing and refining, I want to catalog my collection before I start selling, selling stuff off. That's my, oh my justification for the delay in selling things anyway. Big step here for the knife chunky. Indeed. So uh, I'm trying to, you know, daily, I'm not going to put too much pressure on myself, but, you know, on a, every couple of days or on a daily basis, at least right now, while I'm excited about it, I'm going to take little quick short videos. doesn't matter where I am. doesn't matter what I'm doing, but it's going to, each little video is going to highlight one of my knives in my collection. And then I will have a catalog of everything. And then I can start in good conscience selling stuff. Off, <laughs> they got a plan. Yeah, exactly. But uh, you, you mentioned Instagram. That's how I've discovered so many people, a, a number of people we've had on the podcast here. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's been a continuation of people I discovered on YouTube, like Jeff Blauvelt years ago when he was tough, not, uh, tough thumbs and just uh, pimping knives. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he evolved into a, an amazing artist, knife maker. And uh, and then he was the, uh, you know, he sort of helped Ian Pekarski learn about the craft himself. So it's mm -hmm. kind of cool to see uh, how this uh, just kind of keeps getting passed right. along. And I feel right. like we're males, we're very visual, and, and the whole um, Instagram thing is a, is a great way to get knife people interested. Yeah, it seems like the, the perfect platform for artists, if you will, knife makers, yep. you know, who have something visual to sell, you know, something tangible. And I forget who said it on a recent podcast. You know, a lot of these knives you're buying, you're buying on the Internet, you're buying long distance unless you go to a knife show and mm -hmm. actually see it and touch it. Um, feel it, you know, all you have to do is the site, the picture, you know, how it looks. So Instagram is a, is a perfect platform for that. Yeah. That was Elliot Williamson of Farron Forge. Right. He was talking yeah. about designing not only for the hand, but designing for the eye. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. it translates over, over the internet and you're looking at a knife, you're never going to have a chance to get it in your hand before you buy it or get it in your hand. So. And and that comment about male, I didn't mean to say that uh, only males. I, I actually, <laughs> there is a huge growing community of, uh, it's not a community, but I've, I've noticed a lot of women are into knives. My wife is into knives. That's how I met her years ago, learning how to knife fight. But it is a visual thing. And, and mm -hmm. uh, if you can get people on board with that, with how something right. looks. And so I got to say, Ian Pekarski's work, uh, which we're going to be talking about soon, is dazzling. I mean, you right. look at it, it's... He uses the most outrageous materials. His, his designs are, are gorgeous. They have beautiful flowing lines and very different from Jeff Blauvelt's work, but I could see, I can see how they could come from the same universe. Well, if you want to check out some of those uh, works of Ian uh, on his Instagram, that's Instagram.com slash CMF Metalworks. 
Ian Pekarski of CMF Metalworks. And Bob mentioned the uh, large or growing or whatever community of uh, female knife enthusiasts and knife collectors. If you happen to be one, we'd love to hear from you. Call us on the listener line at 724-466-4487. That's 724-466-4487. Give us a quick little message there about how you got into it. Maybe even uh, get you as a guest on the podcast. We'd love to have some uh, female representation there on the podcast. Bob, we've mentioned Ian Pekarski of CMF Metalworks a couple of times. What do you say we dive right into your interview with him? Let's do it. Follow The Knife Junkie on Instagram at thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram. I want to ask you about these crazy tips and grinds. They they are um, kind of illogical when you look at them. It's like, how can that be sharp? But I... Obviously, you know, I know they are. Yeah. When I can show you, I can stab myself again. It's only <laughs> the third or fourth time today. So you have the this swedge running up the back of a lot of your knives, and it just looks like it all, um, I don't know, it all just kind of blends blends in. It's a crazy looking tip. I, I, I admire it. I, I think uh, Jeff Blauvelt does something similar, someone someone that we'll talk about later. But yep. it, it, it's a real, the way it widens out. The way the uh, edge bevel widens out at the tip, uh, you know, to provide that robustness, it just looks so cool. I agree. It's, uh, I guess a lot of people would argue that it's not the most practical, but it's not the most impractical. Why is it not the most practical? I don't know. I mean, I've heard a lot of like, oh, it's not thin behind the edge. It's not going to be good for cutting. But I mean, on a Tonto, at least on the knives that I've owned, I've never used the tip for slicing purposes. I use it for like splitting tape. Right, right. And and that's the whole point of a tanto tip. Anyway. Yeah. 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 It's not supposed to be slicey. And I drop my knives, my personal knives, not the ones that I sell to people. Right. Frequently. So I like it to be relatively tough. Okay. Do you do you walk around with the knives that you make in your pocket to test them out or anything like that? No. I uh I (laughs) if if I make a knife, it doesn't touch my pocket because I I have uh, generally um I'm known in my small group of friends as the pocket clip killer. Um, I'm, I'm six foot six. So my pocket sits exactly at the, the kind of like edge of the door frame, right? Where that, like uh, where it actually clicks in. Right. So I'll walk through a door and almost every time I'll hit the pocket clip. I'll either break it off, bend it, snap it. <laughs> I, I've ruined a lot of pocket clips, so I don't want to risk my, my customer's knives. Okay, so let's talk about these knives. One of the reasons, I'm sure, one of the reasons you don't carry them around is because you use exquisite uh, materials. I mean, really beautiful material. T- tell me about the materials you use. And you obviously put a, a, a whole lot of handwork into, you know, every inch of these knives. Um, I know there any specifics you'd like me to touch on or just well, well, what, what I use okay, in general? Okay, yeah, like the handle materials, the Mokume. Is that Mokume or is that? Um, uh, that's Black Damascus on the one you were just Damascus. looking at. It is, uh, man, it's astounding. How do you how do you get all of those characteristics to come out of the uh, the material like that? It's just kind of careful coloring. Um, when I got started with Jeff, I mean, he showed me how to heat color. And it's it's just, I've taken his method and changed it a ton to fit kind of my own, my own style. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I use a hot, I use map gas. I use a hotter torch than recommended, but you heat both sides evenly. Just make sure that it's at a nice polish, clean it really well. I mean, that's probably the biggest one and just go slow. And when you, when you start to see it hitting the colors, you want quench it in water. Hmm. Yeah. There's not really, I don't really know how to explain that too much. It's well, not- so you you mentioned Jeff Blauvelt. Uh, I know. Um, so l- let's go back. Like, how did you get to the point in your life where you are making super high end, beautiful, handmade knives? Have you always been a knife guy? I have not. I, I've only been in knives now for maybe five years, less than that, maybe. I mean, I've only been making knives now for two and a half years. Oh my god. Um, I worked at Starbucks until January fourth of uh, twenty seventeen. Uh, full time, and before that, I was modifying ballast songs, and I, I kind of got into the custom knife world. I got more into folders, and I I started looking like around me, and I found Jeff one day posting a picture at the King of Prussia Mall in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Been there many times. Yeah, and I, I kind of thought to myself, like that's right there. So I I tried reaching out to him on Instagram. What once you have that many followers, you get so many message requests that everything just kind of falls through. So I don't, I don't blame them, but my message fell through. So I saved up a few months and uh, I purchased one of his knives 
And I asked him if I could come pick it up. So I went there and brought one of my knives that I was modifying. And I showed him, I was like, I'd, I'd really love to make folders. I'd love it if you could show me how to do this. And, uh, and Jeff kind of took me under his wing. And I think I worked with him for, I don't know, eight months, maybe a little longer, eight, nine months. Mm-hmm. And then I, uh, I moved out to Arizona with my wife. But he, he really gave me a good foundation to start with and working with my own materials, my own machines, and my own shop. I mean, before that, it was just kind of nerve-wracking. Right, right. And, and then, since then, it's just been picking other knife makers' brains and picking up tips and tricks from uh, people like John Gray, Nadia mm-hmm. Moore, Dalibor, Rob Carter. I mean, those kind of guys. Just uh, a who's who. <laughs> yeah. I saw that uh, Rob Carter collaboration knife. Uh, you made uh, the Tanto. Uh, Dr. Frunky featured on his channel. Yeah, the CMF 16. That was yes. uh, that was hidden hardware black Damascus uh, with hidden hardware zirconium balsers, shadow box. I remember that one. That was a cool one. You you just uh, you were talking about hidden hardware right mm-hmm. there, and 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 difficult materials to work with, and and a difficult process I would assume to hide the hardware or or to to create a knife with hidden hardware. It's more complicated, I would imagine. Is there an aspect to this uh, as uh, you know, from your perspective, as you want to make the most challenging knife possible and the most beautiful knife possible, is that, I mean, because you rattled off all those things and I was like, wow, that, that is like a perfect storm of, um, expense, you know, if, if all goes wrong. Yeah. So you're asking me like, how would I progress that further to make it more difficult or? No, no, I guess I'm asking, um, do you push yourself for the challenge or is it more, uh, you know, I'm going to make this knife and it's going to have all of these features and it's really hard and my customer is going to love it. And part of that is because they know how much kind of work and sweat and engineering went into it. So I guess it's more for me to challenge myself. Uh, I really like to see what I can do and kind of push myself. For instance, Right now, one of my goals is to make a knife that weighs less than one ounce of full titanium frame lock. I'm still figuring out what to do, what I can do. And right now, my, my best is 1.7 ounces. Wow. It, uh, do you have a size restriction that you're trying to live up to? or It has to be like a full-size mini knife. So, okay. uh, I mean, I know the people who listen to the podcast can't see it, but this right. one is uh, eight and a quarter inches long. Okay. Uh, my mini is seven and a half inches long. Oh, okay. So that is kind of my parameter. I'd like to leave it that lengthwise. That's kind of where I'm working in. But thickness is where I'm trying to get it. I'm using hundred thousands thick uh, scales. I'm using eighth inch blades. I'm doing hollow grinds. Anything I can wow. do to to shave some weight. And I wish on this last one, I, I kind of like they say hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm still kind of kicking myself for not doing more. Well, there's always time to do more. You can always make another one. Yes, yes. I have to keep telling myself that because it'll stress me out. So, so with this one, you were going for one ounce. You ended up with one point seven. That's yeah. uh, that's still pretty uh, amazing with steel and titanium. Uh, what's your shop like? Um, do you have any automation? Do you use CAD? Do you draw with by hand? What's your process? Uh, so I draw everything out on pen and paper. I don't know how to use CAD. Um, I got with my water jet guy when I got started and he designed me out kind of like rectangular blanks, kind of like coupons. And it just has my lock bar cut out and it has my stop pin location marked and everything else is done in house. Wow. And I I design each knife kind of like on the metal. Like I don't prototype in paper or anything. I just kind of jump straight into the, the physical prototype. I, I have no automation. Um, my mill is barely a mill. It's more of a glorified drill press. <laughs> Belt grinders, bandsaw, buffing wheel, sandpaper, that kind of stuff. So when you're prototyping um, one of your new models, you have a you have a number of models, and I love the names both both the Greek references and then <laughs> and then this weird sort of other <laughs> reference, like, yeah, mistress affair. Honey, what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> yeah. So your finished knives. I look at them every day, basically. Mm-hmm. They're so, they're so, they're taken to such a high level of fit and finish and polish and beauty just with the materials and such. When you're prototyping, I, I would assume you use other materials. Is that right? I prefer to use the highest end materials I can with prototypes, specifically when I'm trying something new. Because when you have that much money on the line, it kind of forces you to work that much harder, especially if you don't know what you're doing. 
when I the, my first hidden hardware knife was a armor core blade with a full billet of Tamascus for the scales. My first time doing anything with Mother of Pearl was hidden hardware Mother of Pearl with a mirror polished blade, which was my first mirror polished blade and uh, black Tamascus hidden hardware scales. Um, I'm working with with gold coming up soon. Wow. And uh, that's going to be fully hidden hardware. And I'm gonna, it's, I find myself more motivated when I use higher end materials for prototypes and new methods. It just it really forces me to be more careful. Right. Like I, I kind of figure out all the flaws up front. I mean, of course, I'll find more flaws down the line, but it's generally that'll push me to work as hard as I can. Do you consider yourself, um, do you consider these works uh, art knives or I, I can't tell if that's uh, if that's considered a different realm or if that's considered a diss in certain realms or what, but are, are yours art knives? I don't know how to answer that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I guess to a certain degree, I, I'd like them to be. Um, I mean, I see them as kind of a way to to express my creativity. Better question. Can you abuse them? I guess. Can will absolutely. they hold up to hard yeah. use? I guess. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't tell someone with a mother of pearl and gold knife to go out <laughs> and start cutting stuff real right. hard. Right. Right. But, I mean, hidden hardware black Damascus and a hand run blade. Go for it. They look so substantial. Like um, there's a sleekness to them, but there's also a. I also love this affair. I love the bulb, not bulbous, the sort of leaf shaped. It's almost like a barong with a little recurve. Mm-hmm. They're aggressive and sleek and beautiful, and uh, they, they kind of hit a lot of marks at once. Mm-hmm. So what's your design process like? Where do you get the inspiration? Race cars. Race cars and, uh, and older, older style, just vehicles in general, uh, airplanes, lines. I mean, it, it's just, God. Uh, I think Jeff put it really well. I mean, if you see a race car, right, you see, a, you see lines that all flow nicely. Like everything's aerodynamic. Everything's organic. Yeah. And then you look at some of the older stuff. And some of the more flowy lines, I mean, I take kind of a bad example, but you look at the beetle, right? It's a lot of bulbous shapes, but it's very organic design. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of where it comes from. I mean, I just sit down and I mean, I'll design maybe 10 knives in a night and one of them will be good. Hmm. I definitely, I definitely draw a lot more losers than winners. So do you have a, a period of time where you're, you're just designing and then you go execute or is it kind of a back and forth all the time? It, it's kind of just one of those things. If it pops into my head, I'll draw it. Even if it's a crude sketch on my iPhone, right? Just as long as I get that idea down, it doesn't have to come to fruition immediately. This uh, affair that I was just looking at. Once you said that, yeah, it looks like the cars they drive in the movie Chinatown. You know, like those big, lush nineteen uh, thirties, you know, sedans mm-hmm. that everyone drove around in. So, what is your favorite part of this process? Right before putting on the pocket clip, there's a ten minute period where your knife has a ground blade, uncontoured handles, and you just really get to see just kind of your design come to life. Um, you don't really get that feeling before the, the blade is ground. But a- after that, you just kind of, you see it and it's like, like that's when you know it's going to work. Like every, everything can go wrong up until that point. Once you're at that point, that knife is is done. I mean, I say that in quotes because I mean, there's a lot more to do, but right. you know that everything's going to pretty much go smoothly from there. And that's kind of like the, I look forward to that moment. Up until then, I know that I'm going to be stressed the entire build. Once I hit that point, it's like, all right, well, this is where the fun starts. Okay, your shoulders relax, and now I'm going to... Yeah, okay. all contour right. the handles, make the pocket clip, relax a bit, contour, do the finish work. That's where the creativity comes out. Before that, it's just functionality and making sure that it's a safe knife to use. It's, it's a knife that is quality and built right. So say you're you're working on a Damascus blade and um, you grind the tang down ever so slightly because I, I know in lockup every every tiny tiny little amount matters. Mm-hmm. Would you would you rebuild? Would you build a different handle to accommodate uh, the blade, or how does that work? Or is that just it? Or it, have you just sacrificed one to the gods? Like if I cut the lock too far? Yeah. Or or if anything happens while while say you're doing a you're doing a, uh, a a blade, like a really nice Damascus blade, and something happens that will affect lockup. Would you design a handle to accommodate that? Or how does that work? You can't just, I, you don't want to just throw away at some beautiful piece of metal like that, right? Most of the blades I've ruined have been Damascus, unfortunately. Oh, 
I know it sucks. I, I probably have six or seven hundred dollars in Damascus blades sitting on my workbench out there that I've just started using as templates. Um, oh. It depends on the problem. Um, one of the things I do is I set my lock up before detent, which offers me a good amount of uh, flexibility as far as screwing up. If I cut the lock a little far, there, there's always ways that I can kind of elongate the lock bar just a hair, okay. um, hit it in a couple points, and then re remill the locker leaf just to kind of stretch the material to work again. Mm-hmm. But in really catastrophic problems, I mean, it's, it's one of the. I'd rather just scrap a Damascus blade than give a product that's not not quality. Well, I wasn't suggesting that you would do that. I was just curious if there's anything you could do to save that. And and I just imagine that there isn't, and that and that the tiniest margin of error can can destroy. You know, <laughs> that really depends on the problem. That that's got to be a white knuckle, uh, you know, experience. Anything that involves tolerance, like um, like the bearing tracks or the pivot hole, if there's something wrong with those, that's kind of like a scrap the blade kind of deal. But I mean, I can fix a late lockup. I can fix a squishy detent. Right. I, it's it's all kind of situational. Tell me about some of the collaborations uh, you've done, some of the collaboration knives and what that process is like. You go from a very solitary activity of making your own ha- handmade knives. I'm sure you're working alone all day, every day. Mm-hmm. And then and then you go into uh, a um, working, creative working partnership with someone, uh, obviously someone you trust and like. How does that change your, your thinking? <laughs> I'd like to start off. Knife making is the loneliest job in the world. <laughs> which is, I think, why knife makers collab so frequently. So the way that I like to approach collaborations is um, it kind of goes both ways. I like to kind of build a blank canvas. Like we were talking about that point where like the blade is ground and the the handles like all together. And that's kind of like that, you know, sigh of relief. Basically, you build it to right before that point. You don't grind the blade. You just the blade. You just have the, uh, the locker leaf done, detent set, lockup set, blade is centered. Everything's kind of moving as a unit. And then you send it to someone else for all the fun stuff. Oh. <laughs> and that, that's essentially how I work collaborations with the people I've worked with. With the one exception being Robert Carter, who just, he and I have sent each other parts that just have sketches on them of the, where the handle's supposed to be. And we've just worked off of that. So why, why is it that you always take that role? Um, I mean, it goes both ways. I mean, that's how I expect to get them as well from other makers. Oh, I get you. It, it just kind of eliminates any of the the, the mechanical guesswork. Like um, I build my knives mechanically different than Brian Efros builds his. Um, and I'm sure he builds his way different than I build mine. So when we send it that way, we know that the functionality of the knife is exactly how the first maker wants it to be. Okay. Okay. So you don't have to change any of that. You just, you get to grind the blade, do the handles, just get to make it pretty, essentially. Don't have to worry about any of the mechanics. Have you had it where you design the blade, the other maker designs the handle, and vice versa? I know you've designed the handles, like in that uh, Robert Carter collaboration, that was your handle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It looked like his blade. So have you done it where it's your blade, someone else's handle? Not physically yet um brian brian and i efros and i have uh designed a knife that we're currently working on where he's designed the overall knife and i've kind of put my my touches on it and uh we're gonna come make that come into into reality here pretty soon i think it's really amazing when you look at a successful collaboration knife and you can clearly see the influence of both makers i like that sometimes uh one will seems to overtake the other you look at it and you and you're assuming it's all just one person, but mm-hmm. someone else had uh, had uh, something to do with it. So collaborating with other makers is one thing. What about this um, this current production model of collaborating with OEMs? Because it is kind of a collaboration. Um, mm-hmm. You're not just sending them a design and they're doing it this day and age, like with We and Riot and Best Tech and those kind of. How do you feel about those kind of uh, situations? And is that something you would uh, you would look to do in the future? collaborate with a custom knife factory or something like that? That is something I'm looking into already. I posted pictures of my collaboration with Alliance Designs. New company out of California? Yep, yep, the Conquest. Um, I, I wish I had it here to show you. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I just gave it to a friend of mine to check out for the weekend. But I, I really like it. I mean, I won't make a production knife of any model that I make custom. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like this, this Mistress R that I've been playing with over here. I mean, I'm never yeah. going to make a production model of that. It's never going to happen. But I have um, a whole book just dedicated to designing knives that I'd love to be made into production knives. Ones that I think are good enough for me to make into custom knives, but 
just don't allow me the same kind of creative freedom to, to play with them right. the way that my current models do. Right. And if you're designing, you know, sitting down and designing 10 knives a night or however many per week, that's that's an awful lot of bandwidth for you to make those all custom. So I could see you wanting to farm them out at, to people who are making at devoted to making excellent knives. I have a couple of Riots and a couple of Wii's and, and they're, I mean, they're great. Now I'm wondering about how they compare to customs because I have no custom folding knives. I only have one custom knife, period, and mm -hmm. it's a fixed blade from attention to detail. It's and it's beautiful. It's my baby. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not my baby, if you're listening, honey. Um but I wonder, like, you you use these knives, Riot especially, you 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 actuate them and you cut with them, and they're spectacular. And it makes me wonder how much better can it get? And and then I think, well, there's one person spending all of these hours on this one knife. It can get better. And and to me, that's uh, uh, I look forward to experiencing it. I think that is a, a kind of a tough one to uh, to talk about because I think better or worse is kind of relative. Man, that's a tough question to answer. Well, I think what I'm suggesting <laughs> you're making me think too hard for this late in the night. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. What, what, I, what I'm suggesting is I think that that the final element that doesn't exist in a Wii or a Riot is the actual soul of the artist that's going into. That's a to, great way of putting it. Yeah, the kind of love that goes into the build. Yeah, and and I I honestly believe without without being a flake that that's actually a real thing. You know. Oh, but, I, I do too. I think. I, I mean, I really like every knife I make, and when I sell it, I mean, I'm selling it to someone who I hope enjoys it. And I think of, I think of uh, production knives as more directly in line with tools. Mm -hmm. Yes. And custom knives, I think it comes back to what you were saying about art knife. I mean, even a lower end custom knife, like a mid tech or something, I, th I still think that would count as more along the lines of an art knife rather than a tool. Mm -hmm. I mean, at their base, they're all tools, but it, right. like, it all comes down to the, the soul and the love that goes into it. Right, because because still presumably there's some handwork going into it at, at the latter part of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, who is your customer? Who's buying your knives and um, like uh, collectors, users? I don't know. I mean, I like. I hope that my customer is someone as passionate about knives as I am. Maybe more so. I mean, I kind of screen each person for custom orders. I mean, they have to be really interested to mm -hmm. for me to like really want to sell them something. I mean that's that's also a tough question to answer. I mean, I don't know a lot of my customers on a personal level, but I can see I can mm -hmm. see their kind of uh, their persona on Instagram and social media and kind of who they are in that sense. I mean, you have the people who actually use their stuff and abuse it, and then you have the people who just kind of like take pictures of it. Yeah, yeah, or collect. Yeah, you know? I, I, I love I, all of those those kind of subgroups. Me too. I I, uh, I had to admit to myself at one point that I was a collector. You know, for a while I was just like, well, I just have these to protect myself. Uh, and then I was like, well, you know, I just I have a bunch of them because, you know, uh, different needs, you know, different things might pop up. And then I realized well, I have a you know a chest full of them. Uh, I guess yeah. I guess there is a bit of a collector in me. And and um, I am been talking about this reduce and refine that Epic Snuggle Bunny has been talking about basically, you know, kind of i ha i don't have to own all the knives i have i could i could start to get a little more mature in 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 my acquisitiveness i guess is the <laughs> word and and then have fewer but handmade yeah. you know and yeah. that's that's i think where i'm going to be headed in the next 5 years i can't you know can't spend that much money but yeah kind of kind of pull down your collection a bit and just kind of focus on certain certain knives yeah. that really speak to you Yes. Yeah. Instead of like opening up the chest, be like, "Wow, they're all so cool," and then getting option paralysis. Geez, I carry that. I carry that. Am I in that mood? What pants am I wearing? Just you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's kind of how I was when I got started. I, I really started buying up knives, and at one point, I think I had like thirty knives. I think now I own four. What 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 are they? If you don't mind my asking, I have a Touch Knife Sparrowhawk uh, Gen One. I have a, a Bala Ballistic Folder, one of his prototype ones. I have a Spyderco Subvert, and I got one more that I can't I can't remember the name. It's a Microtech Alpha Front. Man, I, I applaud your restraint and your discipline. <laughs> discipline equals freedom, as Jocko says, I guess. <laughs> so um, you know, what do you what do you see for the future of your of your outfit? Like I've seen, observed a number of models. There's the sort of uh, Chris Reeve Hinderer Strider model where where you have a small production house mm -hmm. and uh, 
do occasional collaborations and such, or or big factory, or or just you're going to stay custom and do some OEM stuff. Like, where do you see the company going? I think for the time being, at least the next five years, I'd like to focus on um, just kind of maintaining my custom stuff. Um, if I'm going to do any of my own production, it'll be with my dad. He's an engineer. He's really good at that kind of stuff. I mean, he knows all the CAD. I mean, I don't oh. know that. I, you put it. You put CAD in front of me. And I was like, I don't. I don't know what's happening. Yeah, you put a piece of paper on top of it and start drawing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I foresee myself possibly doing some OEM stuff, um, some in-house production, maybe in the next five to seven years, maybe the next next two to three years, a few more production knives, custom knife factory, more alliance design stuff, mm-hmm. um, designs that are more, more geared towards actual users of my work. I mean, um, a lot of my knives have recurves. A lot of the mm-hmm. ones that you're going to see me do productions on won't have recurves. Um, just too much hassle with sharpening and right. people telling me that they're useless shapes. Perceived hassle, if you ask me, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love recurves. I, I do too. As, as you might be able to tell from my design. <laughs> um, By the way, I love the Icarus. So badass. Thank you. I was I was debating on which one to bring inside and fiddle with while we were doing this. And I was like, oh, I'll pick the mistress, not the Icarus. But I have an Icarus out in the shop. Uh, very cool. Thank you. I'm building one for the USN show. And I'm quite excited to show off to people. Nice. That's in Las Vegas? That's in Vegas uh, at the end of August. End of August. Well, why why don't you uh, give a little plug there? You're going to be there. When is it? It's the weekend before Labor Day. Okay. That uh, Friday and Saturday is the actual show. Weekend before Labor Day. So how do you get people to buy your work? Is it all through Instagram? How how can people find you? I know you have a website. I'm looking at it right now. I do have a website that I I kind of ignore most of the time. It's, (laughs) It's just kind of there for people who Google my name. Right. I really got to get better with updating that. In Instagram is uh, kind of my biggest audience. But lately, I've really been in, kind of leaning towards Facebook, kind of the intimacy of having the personal group. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I know a lot of the guys who are kind of like frequent flyers in there. It just feels much more uh, small and secure and a really fun way to sell because everyone's kind of, you know, enthusiastic in there. Right. Instagram, sometimes you have people who just wanted to flip it. It is a private group, and most people have a hard time finding it. And if I Google it, I can't find it. Mm. I don't know how to fix that. I've tried. So for anyone listening, if you want to join my Facebook group, I do have a link to that in the bio of my Instagram at CMF Metalworks. And you just click that, and you make sure you answer the questions, because I'm not kidding. I will decline the offer to come in if you do not answer the questions. Well, there you heard it. <laughs> so how do you think like your your career was born in the age of social media, would you say that your career was born facilitated by social media? I mean, it has, how do you, how do you see social media changing the knife world? I mean, just listening to uh, like the Mark of the Maker podcast, like they're talking about, I can't remember the first names, but like Skagel and, uh, and Randall knives Mm -hmm. and like how they kind of marketed it back in the day. Like it was all done via like magazine. Yeah. It was was all magazine word of mouth. And I, I think, I don't want to say that the amount of knife makers has really increased. I mean, I'm sure it has, but I think, just the availability of seeing all of these knife makers is what's really increased. I mean, there's so many knife makers who have popped up in the last few years. Mm-hmm. I don't know a lot of these guys. I don't know how long they've been doing it, but I think social media has really brought a lot of us together. And it's certainly helped me build my career as other people as well. Yeah. I mean, to me, Instagram, like I have, uh, you know, I follow my wife and a couple of friends, but other than that, it's like, it's all knives all the time. And and, you know, that's that's the beauty of that uh, app in particular is that, you know, any if you're a guy, especially in visual, uh, any interest you have, you can just follow that. And uh, oh, yeah, I, I've discovered you. I discovered so many other people there. It's amazing. It, it is. It is almost scary how many people it's connected me with and how many hobbies I didn't know I wanted to be part of. <laughs> a watch collecting, working, yes. cars. <laughs> Like fixed blades, knives, swords, all that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. Things that I never thought to dabble in. And then, you, you know, you see the one suggested post and it's like, you might like this. And then you go down that whole rabbit hole. The next thing you know, you're making a new social media profile because now you're a full blown woodworker. Yeah, right. Like, exactly. say you're working at as a knife maker. <laughs> you know, I really always knew I needed a war hammer. I just didn't know it until I saw it on Instagram. Yeah, you know? 15 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Right now, the knife industry, where do, you, where do you see it now and where do you see it headed in the future in terms of like the 
I don't know, the level of, of sought perfection. It seems like we want so many options and everything has to be just so. So where do you see things headed? How can things get better? That's a tough one. I mean, I think, I think kind of the rise of the production knife, the high-end production knife, like Riot, I think that's kind of pushed a lot of knife makers to improve. Um, they're competing with essentially a perfect product and we're never going to match that level of quality. I mean, uh, sure, some of us can. I mean, you know, the Rexfords, Randolphs, Lee Williams of the world. But I think generally we're never really going to be able to compete with it. We're just going to have to get as good as we can. I think it's going to be a constant kind of level of improvement. We're all going to have to keep improving as long as we're in this business. I, I don't really foresee custom knives dying out at all. In fact, I don't even really see the market getting smaller, which is kind of a weird thing to say because... uh Production knives certainly seem like there's, you know, a hundred, hundred new production knives for every one new custom knife. Yeah, but it just seems to be like there's a huge, huge uh, population of people who are just getting into them, uh, whether it says like uh, an accessory, you know, what am I going to wear today? I mean, what am I going to carry today? I've said that before to myself. Yeah. Where, where, like I'm picking out a tie, you know, when I'm at my knife drawer. But um, yeah, I, I think there are just a lot more people who are kind of, uh, you know, with the help of knife rights and, you know, changing laws and stuff, it's kind of getting destigmatized. It's, you know, the use and carry of knives is is growing further away from being equated with the use and carry of firearms, which is a more polarizing thing. Everybody's had a pocket knife. Everyone uses a knife on a daily basis. It's a, it's a tool from back when we were all in the enderthralls. Yeah. It's, you're never going to get rid of knives. It's a silly thing to think. So you said you will never, you know, custom makers will never be able to match that level of perfection, but that's where I come back with my soul argument. Yes, but that machine will never have a soul. It might get, it might have its own intelligence. That, you know, that's why I'm day. saying that customs are never going to die out. Yeah. I mean, some people want to buy art. Some people want to buy something that's built by someone. I mean, well, I love yeah. one of my, one of my kind of like, I don't really advertise this because I don't want people coming to my house, but I love hand delivering knives. Like my books mm. are closed. But the best way to get me to build you a knife is to say, hey, man, let's grab a beer at the bar, like 45 minutes away from your house, and I'll make you a knife. We can go meet there and just have like a two-hour conversation. That's and to cool. me, that's like the best part of buying a custom knife. Like if a custom knife maker said, hey, Ian, you want to come pick up this knife and we can grab some dinner and just chat for a bit. Like that makes that knife that much more special. Yep. I, I picked up my one and only uh custom knife from the maker douglas esposito in his shop which resides in the back of his absolutely amazing uh brazilian jiu-jitsu school out here in, in northern virginia mm -hmm. and uh it was such a cool experience because i got to check out all of his you know tools and he had a couple of uh, knives he was working on you know like in various stages and we were talking you know we just had a great hour-long conversation mm -hmm. um he he put a little a uh, little english on the back of my blade for me and uh it was really cool it was a great experience yeah it's cool seeing where something like that kind of comes from the, the hands that made it and kind of the, the tasks that go into it yeah a another reason i think custom knives will never go away is is that they're prestige items and that's what people you know you were talking about watches and cars and 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 yeah there's a there's uh you know a a base uh drive to to have a nice watch and a nice car and all that but a lot of the times it's it's the prestige of owning it. You know, like I'm, I'm the only one who has one of these yeah. Argonauts in the, in the whole state, you know, or whatever, you know, it, it's uh, knowing that it's something special. Yeah. You know, that took a long time to make and a lot of skill to make. Uh, that's what will keep people coming back. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. I mean, even on limited, limited runs of production knives, you're still not the only person with that knife. Custom knives, literally each one is this different. Yeah. And then owning it, uh, it, it becomes a part of you. I, ah, I'm starting to sound a little corny, you know? Well, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there was this uh, knife I built a while back. And um, I mean, I think I know a knife when I build it, right? Like you, you kind of think to yourself, the maker knows his knives the best, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This customer was having a problem where the pivot would seize. Like the blade just wouldn't move anymore. And I couldn't figure out what the hell was wrong with it. I had him send me this knife back three times. And eventually... I replaced like all the pivot hardware. I sent him new pivot screws and everything. And he reached out and was like, so I was like messing with it. And if I turn the pivot like a certain way, everything's perfect. And if I turn it a little more, everything's wrong. Hmm. 
So he sent it back and I'm like trying to recreate this. And this customer knows his knife better than I do, better than I ever will. <laughs> and this, he just like, he fixed it. Like just by turning the right. pivot a little bit, everything was fine after that. It's still fine right now. But like, I couldn't figure out the problem. And he was just messing with his knife. I mean, he knows his work. He knows my work better than I know my work. Right, right. When you were building it, in a sense, it was a problem that you had to solve. You solved it, got it out of your life. And when it came into his life, it was like a joy and a thing that he uh, poured over. I'm sure for a long time it became a part of him. And that's why he was able to fix it. And you weren't. <laughs> I think that's exactly it. I mean, that's another big reason why I like going in custom knives. I, I know my knives, I think, probably better than some of the makers who made them do. So uh, how how frequently do you turn out a new knife? What, like, what's your... Um, like a new design or... A well, new no, no, like your, like, um, I'm sorry, like your batch capacity. Are you are you always working on one knife at a time or do you have do you have knives in different oh, levels man. of development? I, I've got really bad ADHD. Um, I, I cannot focus on one knife for the life of me. Um, at any one time, I'll have seven or eight knives going. And I mean, I might start one on you know, April 1st, 2019. And I'll get it to a certain point. I might not touch it again until August 8th. Mm -hmm. Like it'll just, it'll just sit there collecting. Like, like Picasso, man, he had a whole studio of paintings like that. And some of them weren't yeah. ready for 15 years. Some of them weren't ready for two weeks. You <laughs> my, know? That's my biggest fear is just getting bored. I yeah. can't do it. Like once I get bored with a knife, I have no motivation to build, to build it. Sometimes when you're working on a creative project and you run into a block, you have to go and tackle some other creative challenge to to remove that block because you're forcing your your brain to consider something else. Yeah. And then when you come back to that, the problem, you'll see it with fresh eyes. I had to do that today. I uh, I couldn't decide what what on earth to build. I've been I have this whole list of knives planned out for the USN show, and it's like I keep looking at that list and it's like, well, maybe I should change this to this or this to this. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should get rid of that model, put this model in. And today I, I probably spent two hours. Like I had, uh, I had a movie playing on Netflix in the background on my iPad, and I'm just sitting there, staring at my bench at these two blanks, just contemplating what to do. Like just two hours gone because I didn't have the the foresight to just get up, leave the shop, go play the guitar, play with the dogs, go get some lunch. Like it's just well, if you think you're close, you don't want to waste that working time, you know. If you think it's about to happen. But that's the, the longer you sit there, the less likely it is to happen. Yeah, that's most, true. most of these knives that I design, I mean, I'll wake up in the middle of the night or I'll be driving somewhere and I'll be like, Mandy, you have to draw this out for me. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that, that's how it all kind of comes to. Like if I, if I sit there and think about something for too long, I'll overthink it. Uh -huh. and, and then that's when I start to really get into my own head and I'll get anxious. And then Okay. So, so um, you seem to approach it like an artist. And I, I've, I've spoken to a number of knife makers now and, um, some approach it like an artist and some approach it like an engineer and both, you know, obviously it's a, it's a Venn diagram where they, they cross over deeply, but you know, some you can just tell are wired for art. I mean, the way everything you're saying right now reminds me of when I was in art school, like 15 paintings going at once. Oh, I can't, what's going on here. I'll put something over here and eventually something will come out. That's the artistic chaotic approach. And then there's the engineering approach, which is the, the ordered kind of right brain approach. And, and then the beauty comes out of maybe the utility of it. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm calling you an artist. I hope you don't mind. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll accept that. All right, cool, cool. But also an engineer and you're not making art. You're making, in my opinion, you're making design because art is there just to be appreciated. And this is also to be used. Super glue a razor blade to a painting. <laughs> it's usable, but would you really want to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's funny you say that because I did that in uh, college and in my senior year thesis, one of my senior year thesis paintings, I glued razor blades to it because I was edgy, you know, <laughs> no pun intended. I just thought I was. <laughs> End of the year, I'm, I'm taking all my stuff home and I'm I'm packing up my car and I, I had rolled up, uh, taking all the canvases off the frames and I rolled it up and uh, I'm I'm shoving it throwing all my paintings in the back of the car and as as this cylindrical rolled up painting goes sliding down my hand uh five razors go dragging across my right palm and and slice my palm open and and this is uh this was uh a long time this is over 20 years ago at this point and uh it still itches like on certain days i'm like damn this this and i can still see the scar and it oh, man. yeah 
Yeah. Uh, well, hey, before we close, do you have any stupid knife stories? You, have you ever done anything dumb whilst making a knife or That's using a, a knife? podcast with the stuff? But I'll pick <laughs> out some of the good ones. So uh, I guess I'll start with my first, I guess, custom knife. It was an X10, EX10. It's a ballast song made by a good friend of mine, Jeff Dumas, up in New Hampshire. It was a gift from my wife. And uh, the day I got it, I was sitting on the edge of my bed playing with this ballast song. I mean, razor sharp. Didn't know a thing about ballast songs. I opened it. Of course, I'm not wearing shoes. And it slips and falls straight through the heel of my foot. Oh, God. I had to call out of work for like four days. It bled uncontrollably. Like it happened. And I just slid off the bed, palms down, my whole body pressure on my my heel. And I was probably like that for like three hours. Oh. And I don't forget. My, the only thing that was going through my wife's mind was Ian's getting blood all over the carpet. <laughs> Doing that stupid knife stuff. Oh my ah. gosh, give me those <laughs> knives. Um, that's not how my wife sounds, for those wondering. Right, right, of course. I mean, maybe it is. I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so did it pin your flo- your foot to the floor? I mean, no, that's- no, it went in about a quarter inch. <laughs> but like ah. right on the belly. And it was about an inch long cut. I should have ah. gotten stitches. It, that sucked. It was like right where, I, I mean, I can't show you, but like right where, uh, like an inch away from my Achilles heel. Oh my God. It was miserable. That was not fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, yeah, yeah. Just be happy you didn't slice that. Uh, one time I was, this was before I understood how to mill. I was tr- trying to plunge a half inch end mill into thunderstorm Kevlar, which for those of you who don't know, is kind of like a tan colored Kevlar with interwoven brass strands. <laughs> for those of you who haven't used brass or Kevlar, both of those materials really like to catch on, uh, on end mills. And uh, I was holding it with my left hand and I had the mill going at around 150 RPM and it caught and just dragged my thumb into a moving half inch end mill mm. and removed about the first mm. eighth inch from my thumb. I've ground off pretty much every fingernail <laughs> at some point. Uh, I've caught on fire a couple times. Damn, man. I, when you grind like black Damascus zirconium, I don't like, send titanium. It'll like land. My arm looks like, like a, uh, like it's full of needle holes, but it's just burns. I've got pieces of my my fingers missing from zirconium catching on fire there. Yeah, I've heard that's dangerous stuff. Yes, it is not most fun. So that that adds to the prestige for the owner, and it also adds to the prestige of the maker. Man, yeah, I risk my life making this knife. Here you go, buddy. Yeah, the maker risked his night his life making this Good knife. Life, but definitely limbs and appendix. Well, yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> And if you're not attended to, you know, could be your life. I've cut myself countless times. I mean, I get one of the most frequent questions I get asked is, uh, Ian, why don't you sharpen your knives before you sell them? Like, if you if you notice, a lot of the knives I post on my page don't have sharpened edges on them. And that is because I will take a knife apart 13 or 14 times before, like from the time I say it's done to the time it actually leaves, I'll take the knife apart 10, uh, 10 to 15 times. Right. And I will cut myself every single time. Uh, like the end user probably won't do that because they're not me, but I'm kind of a klutz and I will cut myself. I'll cut myself sharpening a knife. Like it's just bad. So you're, you're a scar collector. I, I am. I've, I've got some pricked, pricked, pretty wicked scars. Well, you know, they're, they're trophies. They're trophies to your effort. Oh yeah. Battle wounds. <laughs> well, Ian Pekarski of CMF Metalworks. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, it was a it was a pleasure to get to get to meet you. Um, I've just been admiring uh, your work for I don't know year and a half now, and I'm like I, I'm glad I got to find out a little bit about what goes into making them. They're um, to me they're imaginative. They they look like no one else's knives. Um, the grinds are crazy to me. The uh, the handles and the materials and the processes I'm you employ to, to get there, I know are not automated. So that makes it even more impressive. So my hat's off to you. And uh, thanks again for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. You know you're a knife junkie if you love your knives more than your kids. Welcome back to the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, before we get uh, the Knife Junkie's final words, I want to remind you that the Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app that you simply put on your smartphone, and whenever you need gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, then all you have to do is take a picture of the receipt with your phone. That's it. You've got cash back. Visit the knifejunkie.com slash save on gas. 
get the app and start saving again. That's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Bob, uh, as we always do, we give you the final word, kind of a recap, thoughts about your interview today with, uh, with Ian of Pekarski of CMF Metalworks. Looking at Ian's work and then talking to him about it and just getting to know him a little bit, uh, you know, during that interview, it, it, it just occurs to me how there is no accounting for talent. Hmm. You can have a desire to become something and work hard and put hours and hours and hours and hours into it and eventually become that. But it, it also helps to have talent and to have an eye <laughs> yeah. and to have, you know, <laughs> an artistic spark. And I feel like, um, when I see people, I've, I've spoken to a number of them here on the podcast who have decided, uh, that, uh, you know, maybe they were always a knife maker and just had to chip away the chaff to get to it. And suddenly, um, they just take off. And I feel like with, with Ian, his work is just so magnificent, kind of so quickly, um, to me, any, in, in mm-hmm. any case, mm-hmm. that, uh, there has to be a spark of artistic talent and, uh, and, and something in there that's a little bit more than just the hours mm-hmm. put into it. So, but it, also, it, but also yeah. a desire, a desire to do it and desire to make a business of it, that kind of thing. So. Oh, no doubt. That that was the other thing. You know, uh, another thing I admire in a lot of the people we talk to here is a business sense. It's not mm. just someone being creative. Uh, it's not just the chaotic side, which I have down. It's, it's the, uh, it's the other side, the ability to turn that into a real world, um, mm-hmm. a benefit to yourself, you know, and, and to distribute your work and get your work made. And, mm-hmm. and I really, yeah, I respect that. It's not just yeah. the, it's not just the smart, uh, it's not just the uh, artist with his head in the clouds. It's the it's the well grounded right guy too. The old know. struggling artist kind of thing, actually making a go of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, that's going to do it for episode forty. But do we, what do we have to look forward to on uh, on forty one? Uh, we're going to be talking to Tim Reeve uh, of mm. Chris Reeve Knives, okay. uh, second generation, uh, taking over the taking over the company and bringing it into the future. We had a oh. really, really great talk. He's a great guy. Yeah coming from a very interesting perspective looking forward to that everybody thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast for bob the knife junkie demarco i'm jim person thanks for listening thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast if you enjoyed the show please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com for show notes for today's episode additional resources and to listen to past episodes visit our website thenifejunkie.com you can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.